our last speaker of this afternoon on reinventing fire is Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Amy is the co-founder of this institute and chairman, emeritus of it. He is also listed as the author of an astonishing 31 books and almost 500 papers. And his prizes include 13 honorary doctorates. But he has only one MacArthur Foundation prize. <laughs> so the search for intelligent life on Earth continues. And uh, now, now and then a, a promising specimen turns up, uh, a much higher primate who can uh, inspire us all, medium, all us as medium primates, as we uh, wander in the bewilderness. Uh, so thank you for the honor of joining this uh, best gespräch for uh, such a beloved being, and happy birthday. Uh, I'd like to round out uh, this, this two-day intellectual feast that Freeman gives us this, this happy occasion to conduct together. Uh, with a synthesis of American solutions, which I promise will contain no math, uh, the computations all behind the curtain, although uh, there will be quite a few numbers. And this is work that uh, 60 colleagues and I did during a year and a half. It's reported in a graphics-rich, readable business book called Reinventing Fire. <coughs> and uh, we had a lot of help from from uh, the business world in both content and peer review. Now, we have in this country a rather peculiar public conversation about energy, which if it were clearly stated and boiled down, would be something like this. Uh, <clears throat> would you rather die of A, oil wars, or B, climate change, or C, nuclear holocaust, or D, all of the above? Oh, I missed one. Or maybe E, none of the above, which is the choice we are seldom offered. When we thought about it, how to do a grand synthesis of energy, we picked this big poetic title because really we were asking, what if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? Could we imagine fuel without fear? Could we reinvent fire? And we picked that title because fire made us human that fossil fuels made us modern. But now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. That's now possible. In fact, it works better and costs less than what we have been doing. So let's see how. Now, four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year uh, four cubic miles of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo. And those fossil fuels have built our civilization, created our wealth, enrich the lives of billions of people. But they also have rising costs to our security, economy, health, and environment that are eroding, if not outweighing their benefits. So we need a new fire. And switching from the old fire to the new fire changes two big stories, oil and electricity, each of which puts two-fifths of the fossil carbon into the air. And these are quite distinct stories. They're less than 1% connected, but they're uh, their uses are similarly concentrated. Three-fourths of our oil runs transport. Three-fourths of our electricity powers buildings. The rest of both runs factories. So to save a lot of oil and the coal that makes a third of our electricity uh, and the gas that can displace both, we can use very efficient uh, transport and land use buildings and factories. But today's energy system is not just inefficient. It is also disconnected aging, dirty, and insecure. It needs refurbishment. But by 2050, it could become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal autos, buildings, and factories, all relying on a secure, modern, and resilient electricity system. So we can eliminate our addiction to oil uh, by 2050 and use also a third less natural gas while tripling the efficiency of using energy and switching to three-fourths renewable supplies. That's the transition I'll describe. 
And by 2050, we found this could cost the United States $5 trillion less in net present value than business as usual, counting carbon emissions and all other externalities at zero value, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, but we found that this cheaper energy system could support a 158% bigger economy, uh, and <coughs> uh, that would be without needing any oil or coal, or for that matter, nuclear energy in the civilian world. And this transition would need no new inventions and no new national taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws, thus and running Washington gridlock. Let me say that again. I'm going to tell you how to run <coughs> a 2.6-fold bigger U.S. economy with no oil or coal, $5 trillion cheaper, with no act of Congress led by business for profit. <laughs> so <coughs> the idea here is to make the necessary policy changes administratively or at a state level and to use our most effective institutions, private enterprise co-evolving with civil society sped by military innovation to end run our least effective institutions. And whether you care most about profits and jobs and competitive advantage or about national security or about environmental stewardship, creation care, climate protection, public health, Regardless of your motives, reinventing fire will make sense and make money. Now, General Eisenhower reputedly said that if a problem is too hard to solve, uh, then rather than cutting it into smaller bite-sized pieces, we should enlarge it and push the boundaries of it out until they include everything the solution required. More options, more synergies, more degrees of freedom. So in this work, we integrated all four sectors that use energy, that is transport buildings, industry, and electricity, and we integrated four kinds of innovation, not just the usual two, technology and public policy, but also two more powerful ones that are normally left out, uh, namely design, the way technologies are combined, and strategy, new business models, new competitive strategies. And these combinations give a lot more than the sum of the parts. Uh, if you play with a full deck with all four kinds of innovation, you also create some deeply disruptive business opportunities. Where to start? Well, in this country, we're paying $2 billion a day for oil, plus another $4 billion a day for the hidden economic and military costs, not counting others, of our oil addiction. So since autos use nearly half the oil, let's start by getting autos completely off oil. And that starts with physics. It turns out that uh, about two-thirds of the energy it takes to move a typical car is caused by its weight. And every unit of energy you save at the wheels by taking out weight or air drag or rolling resistance saves another six units you don't need to waste getting it to the wheels, so it saves seven units of fuel at the tank. Huge leverage for lightweighting. And yet, our two-ton steel autos have had, in the past quarter century, an epidemic of obesity. Uh, <clears throat> they have actually gained weight twice as fast as we have. Uh, but fortunately, we have today uh, very light, strong materials that can make dramatic weight-saving snowballs and can make autos easier and surprisingly cheaper to build, as I'll describe. And that means that when you have a light, slippery auto, you need less power to move it. Therefore, its engine gets smaller. Indeed, it gets so much smaller that you can afford to electrify the traction because you, now you need two or three times fewer of those costly batteries or fuel cells. Therefore, the sticker price can converge toward today's value, and the driving cost per mile, of course, is much lower from the beginning. Uh, so that sequence of innovations can transform automakers from uh, wringing small savings out of essentially Victorian steel stamping and engine technologies to the steeply falling costs of three related uh, learning curves, the ultralight materials, their manufacturing techniques, and electric propulsion. And if you are exploiting three synergistic steep learning curves while your competitor is out on the flat part, one learning curve, you win. Now, the sales of such ultralight electric vehicles can grow faster and their costs can drop faster uh, with the 
help of a temporary policy called a fee bait, that is rebates for efficient new autos paid for by fees on inefficient ones. And in the first two years, the biggest of five such programs in Europe, although not arranged to be revenue neutral, has tripled the speed of improving auto efficiency. The resulting shift to electric autos is going to be as game-changing as shifting from incremental improvements in mechanical typewriters to the dramatic Moore's Law-driven gains in computers. Of course, computers and IT are now our biggest industry, while typewriter makers have vanished. So vehicle fitness, taking the obesity out of the vehicles, opens a powerful new automotive competitive strategy that doubles the ordinarily expected fuel savings over the next 40 years, but also makes affordable the electrification that can save the rest of the oil. Now, America or Japan or China could lead this next automotive revolution. The barriers are formidable, but they're much more cultural than they are technological or economic, and we're helping Detroit's new leaders in supply chain and automakers elsewhere to overcome them. Currently, the leader is Germany. Uh, this year, Volkswagen has entered low volume production of this uh, carbon fiber two seat plug in hybrid car rated at 235 miles per gallon equivalent. Um, specs strikingly similar to ones I wrote in the early 90s. And BMW has started ramping up mid-volume production for this carbon fiber electric car. They say that indeed the carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. And their CEO says, we do not intend to be a typewriter maker because he can look across uh, München to where Olympia used to make excellent typewriters. Now, there are some interesting things that American industry can bring to this party. Um, I brought along my carbon cap, which is a test piece for military ballistic helmets that have been shipping for a few years. And you can tell from the sound, it's extremely strong and stiff. Let's pass it around. Don't worry about dropping it. <laughs> I overshot. Uh, it is actually tougher than titanium. It might fit you pretty well, actually. Let's try it. Uh, it, uh, Tom Friedman whacked it with a sledgehammer as hard as he could without even scuffing it. Uh, and that was made seven years ago in one minute. I'll pass around another few little bits. This is uh, just to demonstrate some induction welding. Uh, no, no one. And uh, this one demonstrates that you can make things with different stiffness and strength in different directions. It's a piece of an army backpack frame that's extremely stiff axially and in this sort of bending, but it's also very twisty. And of course, people who design with metal are not used to designing things with different properties in different directions, but once you learn to do that, you can save a lot more weight and cost. Now, such techniques can now scale to automotive uh, speed and cost with aerospace performance. And indeed, the technology itself has just been bought into the automotive supply chain. Um, they can save about four-fifths of the capital needs for automaking. I'll show you how in a minute. They can save a lot of lives because these materials can absorb six to 12 times as much crash energy per pound as steel and do so much more smoothly. And they can save a lot of oil. In fact, if American automakers adopted these ultralight materials, that would save about one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC's worth of oil and the average cost of the saved oil would be about $18 a barrel. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's actually, as we'll see, to pay for the electrification because the ultra lighting is essentially free. So in essence, there's half an OPEC of mega barrels, saved barrels, to be found by drilling in a very prospective clay called the Detroit Formation. Uh, <clears throat> and those mega barrels are uh, domestic, secure, carbon-free, and inexhaustible. Now, to see why the ultralighting is free, we need to look inside the 67 miles a gallon on gasoline or 114 on hydrogen SUV that my team designed 13 years ago with a couple of European tier ones. There's only 14 parts in the body. Any of you familiar with aerospace will recognize that the structural design is that of an airframe suspended from rings rather than built up from a tub, which is our horse and buggy legacy in the car business. 
And this makes it immensely strong and stiff, but each of these just 14 parts is made with one low pressure die set and can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. In fact, the biggest part here on the side, I can briefly lift with one finger. Uh, in contrast, a steel SUV would have 10 or 20 times more parts in its body and each one would be made with an average of four progressive steel stamping die sets at high pressure. So <clears throat> you just saved about 99% of the tooling cost. And then the parts snap precisely together for bonding, so you no longer need the robotic body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, you don't need most or all of the paint shop either. So there go the two hardest and costliest steps in automaking. So that's how you save about 80% of the production capital, and by the way, the powertrain, the propulsion system, also gets about two-thirds smaller, uh, <clears throat> and those savings together pay for the costlier ultralight materials. That's why the ultralighting is free, even before the carbon fiber gets cheaper, which it's likely to do. Now, <clears throat> the unusual design process we used uh, from the uh, Skunk Works uh, reportedly helped Toyota create this concept car they showed six years ago, which has, it, it's carbon fiber, of course, and it has uh, uh, the same interior size as a Prius, half the fuel use, and one-third the weight. If it were an ordinary, not a plug-in hybrid, it would weigh 400 kilograms. And, uh, in fact, it weighs, it would weigh what I was writing in the early 90s, a good four-seat carbon, carbon, carbon fiber car should weigh, so it was really a thrill to make them, see them actually make one. And lest anybody think they did it for amusement, uh, the previous day before they showed it, the world's biggest maker of carbon fiber, uh, Torre, announced a $0.3 billion factory to mass produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, not a phrase previously heard in the industry. Four other automakers then joined the consortium. So Volkswagen and BMW will soon have worthy competitors, and not only in Japan. Now, the same physics and the same business logic apply with some variations to big vehicles. Uh, Walmart is using, uh, last year, 44% less fuel to move a case of merchandise in their giant fleet of Class A trucks than they used in 2005. That's just through logistics and design improvements, but the technological gains alone in Class A trucks uh, can roughly triple their efficiency. And if you combine that with the triple to quintupled efficiency airplanes designed at place li places like NASA, Boeing, and MIT, uh, you end up with about $0.9 trillion net present value of fuel savings. And in both light and heavy vehicles, today's uh, military revolution in energy efficiency is speeding up these innovations, much as Military R&D gave us the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine industry, the microchip industry. Uh, only this time, the military innovation can leverage oil savings in the civilian sector, which uses 50-odd times more oil than the military does. And that can lead the, the nation off oil much more quickly and give our warfighters mega missions in the Persian Gulf mission unnecessary. And they really like that idea. Of course, as we design and build vehicles better, we can also use them smarter. This is the congestion profile of the United States uh, roads on a typical day with the morning and evening rush hours. And if that were an electricity load shape, we would throw a lot of IT-enabled pricing and demand response and smart grid stuff at it to try to flatten out that shape. But by not yet doing that for road traffic, we are wasting many billions of dollars in idle people, idle vehicles, and idle roads. However, we don't need to just sit back and watch driving double as officially forecast because we now have four very powerful and well-proven ways to reduce needless driving. We can <coughs> charge drivers for their road infrastructure by the mile, not by the gallon. We can use IT to enhance public transport and to enable car and ride sharing. We can encourage and at least allow smart growth and new urbanist real estate development models so that more people are already where they want to be and don't need to go somewhere else. And we can use smart IT to make traffic free flowing. So when you add that up, we can get the same access with 46 to 84 percent less driving, saving another $0.4 trillion. So 
<coughs> when you add all this up and assume a much more mobile society, almost unimaginably so, um, we can end up getting off oil in mobility uh, at a cost averaging about $25 per barrel saved or displaced, and doing that instead of buying the oil for well over $100 a barrel saves $4 trillion net present value. Or if we counted, again, just the hidden economic and military costs of oil dependence, which I did not count, that would be a $12 trillion saving, not to mention um, any avoidable costs to, uh, let's say, environment, health, safety, climate, uh, <coughs> our nation's uh, independence and reputation or global development and global stability. Technologically, it looks like this. To phase out the oil, despite all this extra mobility, we can first uh, use the savings baked into the government forecast, plus the additional ones they didn't count from vehicle fitness, plus a little more for more productive use of the vehicles. And then the amount of energy required for all this mobility becomes so small that it could run on any mixture of hydrogen fuel cells in green, electricity in yellow, and advanced biofuels in orange. That's for the 125 to 250 mile a gallon automobiles, plus the trucks and airplanes, which can use any mixture of hydrogen and advanced biofuels, or indeed the trucks could use natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil, and any biofuels the country might need, at most 3 million barrels a day, uh, <coughs> can be made two-thirds from waste and without using cropland or endangering climate or soil. So <coughs> our, our little team speeds up these oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture, that is where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly. We stick little needles in carefully chosen points uh, in partners like Ford and Walmart and the Pentagon to get that entrepreneurial juice uh, chi uh, flowing again. Uh, and this long transition is well enough underway that even four years ago, mainstream analysts began to see peak oil not in supply but in demand. Uh, Deutsche Bank, City, Financial Times, and so on have forecast that world oil use could actually start falling later in this decade. Uh, remember, the vehicle industries are global industries. Their technologies are highly fungible. And what's happening is basically like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. But the electrified autos that help that happen uh, need not add new burdens to the electricity system. Rather, when smart autos exchange electricity and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they are adding to the grid flexibility and storage that help the grid to accept varying solar and wind power. Therefore, the electrified autos are making it easier to solve the auto and electricity problems together than separately. And for the first time, they are converging the oil story with the second big story, saving electricity and then making it differently. And those twin revolutions in electricity promise more numerous, diverse, and profound disruptions than in any other sector uh, as 21st century speed collides head on with 20th and 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. Now, Changing how we produce electricity gets easier if we need less of it. Today, most of it is wasted, and the efficiency technologies keep improving faster than we install them. So the unbought reserve of megawatts keeps on growing and getting cheaper. But as buildings and industry start to catch up and to get efficient faster than they grow, America's electricity use, instead of increasing as officially forecast by about 1% a year, can actually decrease about 1% a year after allowing for the extra use by the efficient autos. And in fact, the electricity used, adjusted for weather, per dollar of real GDP fell last year alone by an unprecedented 3.4%. And we can keep demand dropping by reasonably accelerating existing trends. Notice that US electric use peaked in 2007. It's been drifting down since then. Uh, <coughs> And in particular, uh, buildings which use three quarters of the electricity
can triple or quadruple their energy productivity with a 33 percent internal rate of return. That is, we can invest a half trillion dollars to save 1.9 trillion, net saving 1.4 trillion dollars, and the savings are worth four times their cost. Uh, industry can also accelerate, doubling its energy productivity with a 21 percent internal rate of return. And to achieve those by 2050, we would just need over the next, let's see, 17 years to ramp up the national average adoption of energy efficiency to the levels already achieved eight years ago in the Pacific Northwest, whatever exists as possible. Uh, <clears throat> now, there is a disruptive innovation here that I'll call integrative design that we've been cooking up at RMI for some decades that can make things work even better because it often makes very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings, thus turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. That's how our 2010 retrofit is saving two-fifths of the energy in the Empire State Building. We began by remanufacturing 6,514 windows uh, <coughs> in an, a temporary window factory down on the vacant fifth floor into so-called super windows that are almost perfect in letting in light without heat and insulate several times better. And those plus better lights and office equipment and so on reduce the maximum cooling load by a third. Then renovating smaller chillers rather than adding bigger chillers saves $17 million, paying for most of the total retrofit and reducing the payback to just three years. A major energy service company had also offered a three-year payback, but for saving six times smaller because they were optimizing components in isolation, we were optimizing the building as a whole system. And some more recent retrofits elsewhere are saving as much as 70 percent, making some old buildings better than new. Let's go to a different kind of building in a different climate. This is a building I live in near Aspen um, at 2,200 meters, 7,100 feet elevation, where it used to go down to minus 47F, minus 44 Celsius on occasion. We've seen up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud, and you can get frost any day of the year. But if you come into this central atrium under super windows that insulate as well as 14 sheets of glass, this is what the middle of the house looks like during a February snowstorm. You can see two of the five banana crops that were then ripening, uh, <coughs> and uh, there's no heating system. It's 99% passively heated. In fact, when I first, uh, th these are our banana crops number 46 and 47, which came out this winter, uh, twins, and actually they were 30 kilos of bananas, so they pulled the tree down. Our, our latest innovation must be self-harvesting bananas. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, when I first moved into this house in 84, it was uh, saving about 99% of the normal space and water heating energy, 90% of the household electricity, half the water, all with a 10-month payback. Uh, <coughs> because it turns out we more than uh, paid for the things that got rid of the heating system by the saved capital cost of not needing the heating system. So this then inspired 32,000 passive buildings in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, like ours, they they have no heating system but roughly normal construction cost. This design approach works actually in any climate. It's been used to eliminate uh, air conditioning as well in climates up to 46C, 115F in California with lower construction cost and better comfort. It's been used in steamy Bangkok to save 90% of the air conditioning energy at normal cost with better comfort. And uh, probably about everybody in the world lives in a climate somewhere between Bangkok and Old Snowmass. But, uh, of course, the technologies keep getting better and better. Uh, the, instead of having this turned into a museum of 1983 state of the art, we recently did a major renovation and upgraded all the technical systems. And we're measuring about 300 data streams to see how much better the new stuff is. The trouble is the measuring system seems to be using more electricity than the lights and appliances <laughs> we're measuring. So it's sort of Heisenbergian. Um, <coughs> But wherever you live, whatever climate, the key is integrative design that gives multiple benefits from single expenditures. So this white arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions, but only one cost. 
and it's much more fun to design that way. Similarly, integrative design can increase the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in industry. Dow, for example, has already captured over $9 billion of energy savings on a $1 billion investment. But there's much more to do. For example, uh, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors, and half of that runs pumps and fans. Well, there are a lot of ways you can make pumps and fans more efficient. There are 35 things you can do to retrofit a typical motor system to save about half the energy with a year's payback. But first, we ought to do bigger and cheaper savings that are not in any official assessment, are not in any of the engineering textbooks yet. Uh, and uh, to give you an example, uh, pumps are the biggest use of motors, and they move liquid through pipes. But a standard industrial pumping loop was redesigned from a supposedly good design to use at least 86% less energy, not by using better pumps or motors or controls, but rather by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. This is not a new technology. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not rocket science. It's just rearranging our metal furniture as designers. Uh, and indeed, in our own house, when we put in a new piping run recently, uh, we were able to cut the uh, piping friction and pumping energy by about 97%. And the capital cost goes down because, of course, the pumps and motors get a lot smaller. Now, what does this mean for the uh, uh, pumping energy and, indeed, for the electricity that is uh, three-fifths used for motors, half of that for pumps and fans? Well. When you feed, let's say, coal into a power plant, there are so many compounding losses after that that only a tenth of the original fuel energy actually comes out the pipe as flow. But if you now reduce the flow or friction in the pipe, every unit of energy you save there compounds back again. You turn the compounding left to right losses around backwards into compounding savings from right to left, Every unit of flow or friction saved in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost pollution and global weirding back at the power plant. And along the way, of course, the components get smaller and therefore cheaper. So our team has found such snowballing energy savings lately in over $40 billion worth of industrial redesigns, everything from <coughs> a uh, data center for Hewlett Packard to this Texas Instruments chip fab Anglo-American and Rio Tinto mines, shell hydrocarbon facilities, and a bunch more. And typically, our retrofit designs save about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with a two- or three-year payback, starting with designs that were supposedly pretty good. And our uh, new facility designs save a bit more, say 40 to 90-odd percent, but nearly always with lower capital cost, expanding returns, not diminishing returns. Now, needing less electricity would ease and speed the shift to making it differently, particularly with renewables, the new marketplace winners. And indeed, China is leading their explosive growth and their plummeting cost, shown here on a logarithmic scale for photovoltaic modules in blue and wind farms in green. Uh, and both of these technologies in the more favorable sites in the United States, sites that are rapidly expanding, uh, can beat the levelized cost of the gas power. Now, in Germany, the photovoltaic systems have an installed cost only half as big as in the United States. We all buy the same equipment, but they install it much more effectively because they've scaled their industry a lot bigger. Each of the past two years, they've installed more in one month that we've installed all year and uh, <coughs> we have about four times their, their population. So unsubsidized U.S. solar power at the German installed price and say in a California climate would come in around six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, <coughs> so today, even though we pay twice the German price, in about 20 of the United States, entrepreneurs will happily put solar power on your roof with no money down and beat your utility bill. That's an unregulated product, and if you combine it with a few other unregulated products, it can add up to a virtual utility that could bypass your power company, much as uh, cell phones have bypassed the wireline phone companies. 
So the industry has rightly become very concerned about this upending of its business model and the potential for radical bypass. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that sort of thing gives electricity executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Uh, <clears throat> of course, incumbents can turn the insurgency into business opportunities as well, and we get those two groups together uh, in our electricity innovation lab so they can actually create value rather than just lobbing grenades. So it's getting to be quite exciting times. Now here's the big picture. Um, worldwide, starting in 2008, half of the new generating capacity added in the world has been renewable. Uh, renewables are getting the majority of the investment. And these curves show not the cumulative added, but the annual additions by photovoltaics and wind power. And this year, actually, the photovoltaics are expected to slightly exceed the wind power. They're growing so fast. Uh, <coughs> the, um, the result is, is really because these technologies have utterly different scaling laws. It used to be that to, to make a lot of electricity, you would build a multi-billion dollar cathedral. It would take you about 10 years. But now, <coughs> in that time, you can build each year a photovoltaic plant, which each year thereafter will produce enough solar cells that each year thereafter, that one year's output of that one plant can produce as much electricity as your original thermal power plant was going to produce. So with that kind of scaling, you can get incredibly rapid growth, much as we see for the similar semiconductor industry. And <clears throat> this helps explain why the modern renewables, renewables other than big hydro, have invested a couple of years ago their trillionth dollar since aught four, and in each of the past two years, modern renewables have got a quarter trillion dollars of private investment and added over 80 billion watts of capacity. In fact, they've, they now have uh, considerably more installed capacity than nuclear power, uh, <coughs> and it's just going out of sight because the world can now produce 75 gigawatts a year of photovoltaics, twice as much as we've been able to install lately. Uh, <coughs> and in contrast, the net orders for nuclear uh, were already below zero before Fukushima and a lot worse lately. Uh, 14 units operating or, or uh, planned have been terminated just in the first two thirds of this year because they can't even compete with uh, the wholesale market on operating price anymore. Uh, and uh, basically, coal and nuclear plant orders are dwindling because they don't have a business case anymore. They cost too much and they have too much financial risk to attract investors against this sort of competition. Now, <clears throat> we are often told that we need the coal and nuclear plants to keep the lights on because we are told they are 24-7, whereas photovoltaics and wind are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. But there's actually no such thing as a 24-7 power plant. They all break. And when they do, a, a big plant's failure means you just lost 1,000 megawatts in milliseconds, often for weeks or months, and half the time without warning. And that's why we would long designed the grid to cope with that intermittence of big thermal units by backing up failed plants with working plants. In exactly the same way, the grid can gracefully manage the forecastable variation of solar and wind power, uh, and the National Renewable Energy Lab last year showed how a diversified portfolio of renewables can run 80 or 90 percent of our electricity reliably with decent economics. But <clears throat> that's also true for smaller areas. And let me give you a difficult case, namely the Texas grid, what's called the ERCOT power pool which in 2050 would normally be expected to have a week of summer load shapes like this. Uh, and if you add the levels of efficiency and use that the academy considers uh, very profitable, it gets smaller and less peaky, but it's still over 30 billion watts. So let's run that all on renewables. We'll get 86% of the annual electricity from a combination of wind and photovoltaics. You can see how variable they are. And then we'll get the other 14% from renewables that you can have whenever you want. They're dispatchable like geothermal, solar thermal electric with night heat storage, uh, small hydro, uh, municipal solid waste combustion, burning energy studies, uh, burning feedlot biogas in combustion turbines, 
So now we're 100% renewable, but you can see it doesn't match the load shape very well. Sometimes we have too much, sometimes not enough. So let's take the surpluses and store them in two kinds of distributed storage fully built out, namely ice storage air conditioning and smart charging and discharging of electric vehicles. We can then get that distributed storage back when we want it, fill in the last bits with unobtrusively flexible demand, and now we have reliable power every hour of the year with no bulk storage and with only 5% of the renewable generation left over. So the economics should be very good. Uh, this is not just theory. It's a this choreography is actually practiced in a number of European countries. Uh, Germany is 23% <coughs> um, renewable electricity. Uh, I can tell you, by the way, Practically everything in the time story, 18 September on this, was wrong. They got snookered by a disinformation campaign. Uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of blogs up. Uh, if, you, if you Google Germany's renewables revolution, it will tell you what's actually happening and refer you to the primary sources. Uh, Denmark was 41% renewably powered last year. And uh, in the first half of this year, Portugal was 70% renewably powered uh, Spain 48, and the Portugal 70% was up from 17% eight years ago. It's quite remarkable how fast they've gone. So their grid operators are busier, it's more complex, but they're good engineers and the lights stay on fine. And back home, Iowa and South Dakota are about a quarter wind powered. My own utility has briefly reached 57% wind power, Excel in Colorado, so much for supposed reliability limits. And in fact, last year, uh, Half the capacity added in this country was renewable, 69% in Europe. And San Diego Gas and Electric expects that on sunny afternoons, within just two or three years, its fossil fuel generation will drop to about zero because solar power is coming in so fast there. So <coughs> this is, uh, I think, a good point at which to observe that variable does not mean unreliable. For a stormy month in France, the grid operator reports that the red line shows the actual wind power output of France, and the blue line is the forecast of that quantity one day earlier. I'll bet we wish we could forecast demand that well. <coughs> and there's also a big trend going on in a number of countries, uh, illustrated here by Denmark, which has shifted over 32 years from centralized coal plants to highly decentralized wind in blue and ag waste cogeneration in brown. And <clears throat> about 86% of their wind capacity, like the majority of the German renewable capacity, is actually owned by citizens, communities, and uh, cooperatives. Uh, and the conservative government of Denmark is planning 100% renewable energy, not just electricity, by 2050 at essentially no extra cost. Denmark is also reorganizing its grid into a cellular architecture that makes cascading blackouts impossible. Now, in America, we have this aging, dirty, insecure energy system that we have to replace anyway by 2050. We could replace it with more of what we've got, with new nuclear and so-called clean coal, with centralized renewables, with distributed renewables. Surprise, they all cost the same. But they differ profoundly in risk around national security, uh, fuel, finance, water, technology, climate, and health. For example, we have an over-centralized grid that is alarmingly vulnerable to cascading and potentially economy-shattering blackouts caused by operational problems, bad space weather, bad earth weather, earthquake, cyber attack, physical attack, and these are not just theoretical. Uh, however, this blackout risk disappears and all the other risks are best managed if we pick the distributed renewables future and reorganize the architecture of the grid into netted islandable microgrids, which normally interconnect but can stand alone at need. So they can disconnect fractally, reconnect seamlessly. That's the way my house works. Uh, it works with or without the grid. We had two blackouts last week and my wife didn't notice. Uh, <coughs> and um, by the way, this is also the Pentagon strategy for military power supply because they need their stuff to work and so do the rest of us whom they're defending. So at about the same cost as business as usual, this resilient architecture could maximize security, customer choice, entrepreneurial opportunity, and innovation. So let me summarize the electricity sector, that story. 
Together, efficient use and diverse, dispersed, renewable, resilient supply are turning the whole sector upside down because utilities just used to buy central plants, a little efficiency of renewables. We would reward those utilities for selling us more electricity, penalize them for cutting our bill. But now, especially where we reverse those incentives and reward them for cutting our bill, and in the three-fifths of the states where demand and supply side measures can compete in the same auctions, the investment's going other way up, strongly toward demand side improvements and <coughs> diversified portfolios of renewable supply with smart grids and ways to make all the moving parts work together. Uh, so our energy future is not fate but choice, and that choice is extremely flexible. In 1975, government and industry insisted that the energy needed to make a dollar of real GDP could never go down. So it was considered heretical when I said in a foreign affairs article it could go down threefold. That's pretty much what's happened. It's gone down over twofold so far. And with today's better technology, integrated design, uh, better finance and marketing channels, we can now see clearly how to triple efficiency all over again at only a third the cost that we paid back in the early 80s. So to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge and integrate it. And the results may at first seem incredible, but as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> uh, <coughs> now, combine the oil and electricity stories, and you have the really big story, reinventing fire, where business, enabled and sped by smart policies in mindful markets, can lead the country off oil and coal by 2050, uh, save $5 trillion, grow the economy 2.6-fold, cut carbon emissions 82 to 86 uh, percent, and at the same time provide the most effective solutions to the global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And we have little initiatives and projects at RMI to help this happen faster. Uh, of course, there is a lot of old thinking around, too. The former oilman, Marie Strong, said not all the fossils are in the fuel, but... Uh, <coughs> As, as uh, Edgar Woolard reminded us when he chaired DuPont, uh, companies hampered by old thinking won't be a problem <laughs> because in the long run they won't be around. So what I've described here is not just a once in a civilization business opportunity, it's really one of the greatest transitions in the history of our species because we humans are inventing a new fire. And it's not dug from below, but flowing from above. I even heard theologians talk about energy from hell and energy from heaven. And the new fire has very different attributes. It's not uh, <coughs> scarce but bountiful. It's not local but everywhere, not transient but permanent, not costly but free, and, but for a little transitional tail of natural gas and a bit of biofuel grown in ways that sustain and endure, this new fire is flameless and efficiently used. It really can make energy do our work without working our undoing. Now, each of you owns a piece of the $5 trillion prize. Our book describes how you can capture that opportunity. And we've just partnered with leading organizations in the Chinese central government to bring this thinking into China's 13th five-year plan. So with the conversation begun at reinventingfire.com, let me invite you each to engage with each other and all around you and with us to help make the world richer, fairer, cooler, healthier, and a lot safer by together reinventing fire. And thank you for your prolonged and kind attention.